Hello, and welcome back to the sixth instalment of my failed franchises series. In this series, I look at failed rail franchises, whether this be their contract being stripped from them, or their franchise simply being deemed poor by the public and industry. Today, I look at First Capital Connect, once voted Britain's worst train operator, to see whether it can really be deemed as a failed franchise. Find out in today's video. In 2005, the Strategic Rail Authority announced that Danish State Railways and EWS, First Group, John Laying and MTR, National Express and Stagecoach had been shortlisted to operate the Thameslink and Great Northern franchise in London, taking over from Govia in mid-2006. Given that this video is titled First Capital Connect, I'm sure you can take a stab in the dark and assume who won the franchise. Yes, on the 13th of December 2005, First Group were awarded the franchise, to commence, ironically, on April Fool's Day, April the 1st, 2006. The franchise was originally set out for nine years, finishing in 2015, but this was revised later in the franchise. Nevertheless, on April the 1st, 2006, First Group, branded as First Capital Connect, took over running from the Thameslink franchise, conjoined by the new Thameslink upgrades, which began in 2007. First Capital Connect, or FCC, ran services through central London and the Thameslink core, from Bedford to Brighton, Luton to Sutton and occasional services via Barbican to Moorgate. All Thameslink services ran via London St Pancras, Farringdon, City Thameslink and London Blackfriars. As well as this, FCC ran services out of London King's Cross and Moorgate, towards Letchworth, Peterborough, Cambridge and King's Lynn, on the Great Northern franchise. Essentially, FCC ran almost two separate routes, the Thameslink routes and the Great Northern routes. This meant its fleet was separated and rarely mixed. For Thameslink routes, FCC used nearly 20-year-old Class 319s as well as more modern Class 377s. For Great Northern services, First Capital Connect used Class 321s, Class 365s, Class 317s and Class 313s, with the 313s being used on the Moorgate branch. First Capital Connect didn't take long to start doing wrong, in 2006, they introduced peak fares for people leaving London in the evening peak, making some students pay an increase of £300 a year. FCC combated this by introducing a Student Connect discount scheme, but this still overall increased the price students had to pay. In 2009, FCC confirmed their intentions to fully or partially close up to 50 station ticket offices, including Elephant and Castle. Luckily, London Travel Watch rejected these propositions. In the same year, First Capital Connect drivers refused to work overtime or during rest days, rejecting a pay increase of 3%. This meant FCC were unable to run their full timetable on its Thameslink services, and an emergency timetable was hastily implemented, with First Capital Connect blaming poor weather and heavy snow. However, the snow had ended by the 6th of January 2010, but the emergency timetable lasted longer until the 18th, with delays continuing until the end of the month suggesting FCC were lying about why the emergency timetable was put in place. This was not helped by First Capital Connect having one of the most overcrowded services in the country, with the 0715 Cambridge to London King's Cross service having 76 people standing for every 100 seated. FCC did amend this service in May 2009, bringing it to 12 carriages up from 8. This and the emergency timetable led to very low customer satisfaction. Secretary of State for Transport Lord Adonis suggested the Thameslink route in particular was shoddy and substandard, threatening to strip the franchise from First Capital Connect if the poor services continued. To make matters worse, First Capital Connect were ranked the worst operator in Passenger Focus's 2009 passenger survey, achieving just 75%. The company was slammed online, with the Facebook group I Hate First Capital Connect gaining over 2,000 members as well as a 5,000 strong anti-First Capital Connect petition being handed to Downing Street, with support from several MPs across differing parties. RMT General Secretary Bob Crow suggested the stock was something out of the Bronx, and that FCC was a general rip-off, highlighting the £90 million profit FCC made in 2009. Some customers during the emergency timetable had journeys lengthened from 20 minutes up to 1 hour 20, with Paul Burstow, Liberal Democrat MP for Sutton, wanting the franchise nationalised. FCC came back regarding the poor rent 2009 by highlighting how they had ran a normal service on the Great Northern routes and that they had been dealing with compensation swiftly. However, it was all still dreadful for the company. 
Later in September 2010, First Capital Connect faced huge backlash over an incident with a collapsed individual at St Albans, where FCC staff were instructed not to help the man with medical support, despite the staff being trained in medical support. This left passengers having to help the collapsed person. FCC later said that despite their staff receiving full medical training, they were only permitted to help other employees. Commuters said the staff were milling around and not very certain what to do. Staff falsely claimed to passengers who were trying to help that they had not received training, in an attempt not to have to help the person. Passengers were rightly angered by this, suggesting it was a moral obligation to support fare-paying passengers. Indeed, the man who had collapsed had got off a service at St Albans as he was feeling unwell, so he must have been a fare-paying passenger. The health and safety executive strongly recommended First Capital Connect to reconsider its policy, although there was no clear evidence that this policy was changed, although I would like to think it was. Just a month later, in October, FCC was slated for poor customer service communications after 15 passengers forced doors open on a failed train near Cambridge and walked up the line to Foxton Station, endangering many people. A year later, in 2011, more passengers were stuck in trains and there were more safety concerns in the network. Overhead wire issues at Farringdon had led to a busy rush hour service being trapped near Kentish Town. There was no air conditioning, water or communication aboard the stricken train with it not having any power. Once again, people decided to just walk up the tracks, causing many other issues. Eventually, the unit made it to Kentish Town, but the rear doors in the last three coaches remained open for the mile journey to Kentish Town, posing more danger to passengers, especially as the service was nearly full and standing. At Kentish Town, there were no First Capital Connect staff to give information. Passengers were stranded on units and along the whole Thameslink network for up to three hours with First Capital Connect once again being slammed for little to no communication along its network. However, for passengers, 2011 was a somewhat good year. Siemens were given the contract for the new Class 700 trains, which would replace all Thameslink trains on the Thameslink route, with Thameslink eventually being its own TOC brand, which would incorporate Thameslink, Southern and Great Northern franchises. Whether First would run these new trains and franchises was unknown at the time. Just before we look at the last few years of First Capital Connect, do you consider liking, subscribing, checking out my full series and joining or donating to the channel if you are enjoying this video? A huge thank you to my business class member Anthony Harris and my standard class members Callum Martin-Bell, Deva Rooney, Gordon Walker, Jack's Railway Secrets, JMSF, Louis Donnellan, The Northern Irish Explorer and Thomas Forbes. You can join them for as little as 2 a month and get early access to videos, shoutouts in all videos, access to private Discord channels, and more. Also, thanks to my donators, Clive's Travel and Trains, Deva Rooney, again, G Patterson, and Swansea Valley Bus Spotter. All proceeds go towards me making my videos as good as they can be, so I appreciate it all hugely. Thank you. Also, do you consider joining my Discord server for free, link in the description, as in my donation links, to chat with me and many other rail enthusiasts. Thank you everyone. And let's look at the last years of First Capital Connects. In 2012, there was some good news for First Capital Connect passengers, although not for the company. Someone had managed to find a loophole in ticketing that meant if passengers on weekends wanted to travel from London to many places along the First Capital Connect network, it could be cheaper purchasing a return ticket from your destination. For example, passengers who wanted to take the 1503 Kings Cross to Cambridge service could just pay the flat single off-peak fare of £21.20 or they could buy an off-peak return from Cambridge to King's Cross for just £16, and this was all legal according to National Rail's conditions of carriage. So you could use a return ticket on one leg, rather than starting at Cambridge and having to travel to King's Cross before travelling to Cambridge again. Services to Stevenage, Hitchin and Hatfield were also included in the loophole. Of course, if you wanted a return ticket from London to Cambridge, it would be still much cheaper to buy a return ticket. This was First Capital Connect's main argument suggesting that it benefited many people and boosted rail passengers, with more people using return tickets. However, for some, tickets got more expensive. In 2012, it was revealed that First Capital Connect had altered Carnet tickets, which are a European initiative where you buy 10 tickets in bulk for the price of 9, reducing the need to buy tickets at the ticket offices and able to mix peak and off-peak tickets together, which were popular for business commuters. First Capital Connect had made the tickets so that you had to include 5 inbound and 5 outbound tickets, meaning half the tickets, if you worked for example 9 till 7, were useless, so you had to buy more expensive peak day return tickets. 
This meant for many passengers a backdoor rise had occurred without many realising and without consultation. Train operating companies could increase the price of these carnets without telling passengers, with Passenger Focus suggesting that companies should promote the use of carnet tickets. FCC highlighted that carnets weren't taken by staff upon exiting a station, meaning they were open to fraud and some passengers used them again and again, costing the rail industry £400 million an annum. First Capital Connect highlighted that the carnets would now be taken in by staff when passing through a station, and that its policy was now brought into line with other operators in the UK. However, the lack of notice had led to passenger dissatisfaction and untrust. The end of 2012 wasn't any better for FCC either. They were voted the worst train operator in the country by commuters in a witch poll. Just 40% of commuters said they were satisfied with First Capital Connect, coming bottom of the pile below Greater Anglia, South Eastern and sister company First Great Western. However, in the same period, irregularities were discovered in the UK franchise process, so the UK government had to hastily extend the contract for First Capital Connect for a further two years until the franchise process could be rectified. Abellio, First Group, Govia, MTR and Stagecoach were all selected as bidders for the next franchise in 2014. Obviously, this extension of the First Capital Connect franchise, without First Capital Connect actually being any good, was very unpopular. 2013 didn't get much better. In March, First Capital Connect was once again criticised for its poor customer satisfaction levels after it wrongfully fined a passenger before accusing them of not understanding the rules. This came after Seven was running a promotional offer for tickets that was also valid on First Capital Connect services, which FCC ticket inspectors did not realise. First Capital Connect refunded the passenger and apologised. Of course though, this tarnished the company. In July, FCC were once again slandered after a staff member purposely ignored a blind man calling for assistance, even though the staff member was in First Capital Connect uniform. First Capital Connect suggested that the man was an agency cleaning worker, with the worker being called back by other passengers who realised the cleaner hadn't helped the blind person. The cleaner apparently said he wasn't allowed to help. First Capital Connect apologised and said they would increase training for all staff to assist passengers. To make matters worse, FCC were fined £75,000 in September for the incident between Kentish Town and St Pancras mentioned earlier in 2011, declaring that they had breached health and safety regulations. Another ticketing fraud issue emerged in October, after a St Albans lawyer found the annual First Capital Connect fare to London from St Albans could be £700 cheaper if he bought a ticket from Watford North. On the National Rail Planners, anyone with a ticket from Watford North to London could also travel on First Capital Connect services from St Albans into London on a completely different line using First Capital Connect. He, perhaps rightly, got stopped by ticket inspectors who suggested the website was incorrect and he should have travelled from Watford North to Watford Junction and then taking London Midland or Virgin Trains into London Euston. The man then had to buy another ticket for £1,600 from St Albans to Elstree, as, according to First Capital Connect, the Watford North ticket was only valid via Elstree, not St Albans. He then sued FCC, who settled the decision out of court, although FCC attempted to fight the claim. Despite the association of TOC saying that the route the lawyer took was valid, and his loophole was technically legal. He was later awarded £2,100 due to FCC, continuing to fight the case, and to pay off the other season ticket he was forced to buy. FCC suggested the loophole came from British Rail previously, and rectified the loophole so tickets from Watford North to London were no longer valid via St Albans and First Capital Connect, instead only with London Midland. 2013 was quite a bad year for First Capital Connect, with the company then absolutely slated in October for tweeting that climate change was an illusion, in relation to a complaint about the trains wasting their heating. As expected, many people disagreed and replied with proof that climate change was indeed real. Eventually, after some more denying, another First Capital Connect staff member took over the account and apologised, highlighting how FCC was environmentally aware, with Jay, the person previously tweeting on the account, being spoken by the company. Some commuters even suggested they were now avoiding First Capital Connect. Ironically, a week later, FCC launched their Green Week initiative to tell people what they were doing for the environment. To end their last full year of the franchise, First Capital Connect threatened a lady with court action after a staff member sold her the incorrect ticket from a ticket office. She was forced to pay the full ticket that she should have had, and then a fine. The ticket inspector and First Capital Connect 
so that there was no proof that she actually went to a ticket office instead of a machine, except at Kentish Town, where she purchased the ticket, it had no self-service ticket machine, so it was impossible to buy the ticket from a machine, hence it was FCC's fault. It turned out the ticket difference between correct and incorrect was just 90p, and when the Guardian brought up the case with FCC, they withdrew court action. The lady was refunded and then given a pair of first-class tickets on the FCC network. It only took a major newspaper and several months to get to that point, which definitely hindered the company. Something that I've failed to mention is the overcrowding First Capital Connect have experienced throughout their franchise. Inadequate rolling stock, especially on the Thameslink routes, led to huge overcrowding. Services, which should have ideally been 8, 10 or 12 car trains, were at max 4, 5 or 8, and passengers weren't happy. The footage you're looking at now is from a YouTube playlist titled Why I Hate First Capital Connect, and has over 50,000 views. Overcrowding isn't the only thing highlighted on this playlist, which spans several years of First Capital Connect's operations. Unexpected delays, faulty help points and services skipping stations were all featured, highlighting the inadequate service FCC ran, even when transport ministers insisted everything was running perfectly fine. In 2014, the franchise was due to end, and it was announced that Go Ahead and Keolis had won the new mega franchise for the Thameslink, Southern, Gatwick Express and Great Northern companies, under the GTR Govia brand name. Govia already ran Southern and Gatwick Express at the time, which would be inserted into the new mega franchise. The franchise was slightly different, with Govia handing over revenue to the government rather than paying premiums. Govia would be paid a flat fare of £9 billion over seven years, with 3% profit expected. Govia would oversee new Southern and Gatwick Express units, as well as the new Thameslink Bi-Mode Class 700s mentioned earlier, as well as new stock for operations into Moorgate. First Group said they were proud of the operations they had ran over the eight years of FCC operation, and had made many improvements. New Class 377s were introduced, Class 365s were refurbished, along with all of the first Capital Connect fleet, and the company had run the first 12-car service from Bedford to Brighton, as well as many other new services and 30,000 extra seats. However, it wasn't all over. RMT announced that their engineers for First Capital Connect would strike over job threats by Siemens and the newly announced Thameslink franchise. A deal was eventually struck, but services from First Capital Connect's Bedford Caldwell depot were disrupted and ended eight years of passenger dissatisfaction on the First Capital Connect network, despite the improvements previously mentioned. On the 14th of September at 2am in 2014, First Capital Connect ended services and ended eight years of passenger dissatisfaction. Thameslink have improved services overall, and the introduction of the very good Class 700s have improved things, especially when you compare them to the 319s and 377s they replaced. So then, can First Capital Connect be classed as a failed franchise? Personally, I never went on them, but from what I've researched, they seem pretty corrupt, and ran old stock with major reliability issues. So in my opinion, I would say yes, yes they are a failed franchise. But what do you think? Did you travel on First Capital Connect? And if so, were they any good? Do let me know in the comments below. Also, if you did enjoy, do like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.